Mel Mai Haere Mai. Welcome to the Maxim Institute podcast. My name is Jason, and I'm the communications manager at Maxim Institute. This is our weekly short form podcast. These podcasts are released in tandem with our weekly column and are a chance for you to hear in depth from the column's author about some of the thinking that went into producing their final piece. Today, we talk to researcher Marianne Spurdel about her latest column. Marianne, welcome along to the podcast this week. Great to have you with us. Hi, Jason. We are talking about your latest column, Only Better Tech Can Recharge the EV Revolution. Now, I love the whole column, but there's one uh, sentence here that you've got that kind of stuck out for me as I was reading through it. We That subsidies and quotas that are propping up the industry help us or, or maybe don't help so much, but instead trade one form of pollution for another. What are you what are you getting at there with that? And I mean we could be talking about anything. There are always trade-offs. Yes. yes. And the discussion around different policies really people love to ignore the trade-offs yeah. and just go, here's our magic bullet. Yeah. And everybody feels very good about jumping on board yeah. to this, this here's great my solution. Special thing that I have come up with that will fix everyone's problems. Yeah. Just don't just don't look don't at it too ask closely. Too many questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean the big reason for the policies that have been pushing EVs, because mm. we've had subsidies for people buying Teslas, mm. and we've had taxes on people buying utes. Mm. Um, the idea was that we were going to create something better by encouraging people into EVs. Mm. And that was going to make up for the fact that you're taxing the vehicles that our farmers and our tradies yes. need. Yes. You know, like you, you really need a very good reason to do something like that. Mm. And you're subsidizing cars that generally only people with a decent amount of cash already can afford. Mm. Mm. But the idea is we're actually creating a better world for everyone. Mm. But you've got to factor in where the cars come from. Yes. And what it actually takes to run them. Yes. And then what happens to them when they die. Mm. And there's very little discussion about the true costs of that. Mm. We tend to see EVs as a thing in themselves, right? And they're kind of enclosed bubble without the manufacturing side of it or the afterlife, aftermarket life. Yeah, just the name, the clean car discount. I mean, they're clean cars, right? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Great PR there, isn't it? (laughs) There's nothing dirty about them (laughs) except for mining the materials for the batteries. That's actually very problematic. Mm. Um, And the um, employment practices around that would never fly in New Zealand, but we're supporting that by supporting EVs. Mm. And creating demand uh, that they can't supply, even with these terrible well, this practices. Is, this is the problem. We're, we're mandating ourselves into using a certain number of these vehicles when we don't have that kind of supply of mm. many of the materials it takes to make them. That's a problem. Yeah. And then running them. Um, so even if you've got wind farms and solar panels, well, the solar panels, there's issues recycling them. Yeah. There's issues recycling the wind farms. Yeah. So the technology needed to to make that side of things, the electricity mm. clean, isn't there yet. Mm. And not even um, just that, but also the grid itself that we have, right? Can't you raised sustain. the point that our grid can't sustain if we all switch to EVs today. If we hit these aspirational targets mm. for EV use, the grid would implode. Shut down, yeah. So, <laughs> there are some issues to yeah. figure out. And it's not that EVs aren't a wonderful idea. Mm. It's we have to address these realities before we start, you know, getting the market to unnaturally go in a direction that it's not ready to go. Mm. Mm. And we saw this a little bit with, uh, I guess you'd say, the correction of car yeah. sales figures in January, yeah. right, where sales of EVs crashed and then all of a sudden ute sales went like up through the roof, yeah. Because everybody who was thinking of getting an EV had to get in before the end of December or they'd be paying a premium. Yeah. They'd be paying the real price. Yeah. Really? That, that's all. They'd be <laughs> paying right. the real price. Yeah. And then obviously with the Utes, why would you buy one in November or December? Yeah. When, when you know that the tax, the tax is tax coming is off. Away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was a blip that's not going to be um, significant long-term, but that's showing the adjustment in the market mm. to what things actually cost people Mm. and the running of it while you're running it evs are lighter on the environment for the most part they Mm. go through tires faster yeah they that's because their their batteries are heavier and that's right yeah they're considerably heavier so if you've got like a little four-door 
PV, if you've got a Prius, yes, um, it's going to be heavier than a Civic considerably. Oh, wow. um, so the roads are going to need more maintenance. Mm. So bringing in um, the road user charges yes. for them is perfectly fair Yes, because they're actually putting a heavier burden on the roads than mm. other cars. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that that's all fair enough because yeah. – we can't actually sustain the number of EV vehicles that um, the government's trying to. Mm. It's a box to, box to think yeah. exercise. It's yeah. saying we've got these environmental goals and the way we're going to get there is everybody's going to drive an EV. Yeah. Well, the, the way you kind of finish your column is talking about how we should maybe spend less time on aspirational um, policies, which is like everyone's going to drive an EV and and we'll all be carbon neutral, as an example, um, and more effort into discovering and supporting the best and most necessary innovations. Um, kind of arguing for that middle of the road solution yeah. where there's compromise, kind of like politics used to be, <laughs> where you look at all the options and kind of settle on what was the best one overall. Um, I wonder if it, do you think, we are caught on these aspirations to the detriment of seeing any progress that we might be making. Like you say, EVs are a great thing, renewable energy is a great thing, and we've come a long way, and a lot of our New Zealand energy is is green-generated energy. But we, we're not at carbon neutral yet, so we, we get really upset about that. Another thing that I think of is the road toll where – we want to be at zero, but we don't realize that the roads over the last 30 years have become much safer. Yeah. Um, and so we're stuck on the goal. Yeah. 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 What What is our goal and how do we measure success? Yes. And for, for governments, for anybody who wants to be seen as doing something, mm. it's much simpler to reduce things down to something that is very easy to sell yes and then not discuss the trade-offs yes but you have to discuss the trade-offs if you actually want to find out the best target and the best method to get there mm. you have to discuss the trade-offs mm. and so if you dismiss everybody who's got problems with EVs as being a you know a climate denier or a in, any other theorist story, or yeah, whatever yeah. yeah and i mean any any topic that's in the news at the moment this applies to yes. if you just dismiss people who have a different opinion as being ignorant or corrupt or you know any of those things there could be people who are you mm. know a racist there could be people who are but for the most part they're legitimate concerns that people have mm. because everything has trade-offs. Mm. So discuss the trade-offs. Yeah. If you're for a policy, address the negatives and go, this is why I think it's worth those mm. negatives. Mm. Um, and we haven't really had that debate with the whole EV thing. We've just had um, a single goal in mind and yeah. everything that meets that goal is good mm. and everything that um, doesn't is bad. But I do think that there are really helpful solutions that don't sell so well. Looking yeah. into technology around, you know, maybe recycling mm. um, the things from wind farms. Yes. Recycling the batteries yeah. so that we don't end up with toxic waste. Yeah. So you don't need a hazmat suit to dispose of a battery or something like that. And you don't need to be constantly mining for more materials yes. because it's not sustainable. Mm. And EVs don't live as long. Mm. You're not, you know, my car's 15 years old. Yeah. It will be very rare to have um, the current type of battery perfectly healthy after 15 years. Yeah, yeah. You know? So that means at the moment we've got serious issues around recycling mm. that have not been solved. Mm. If the government wants to pick a horse, which is not very good at doing <laughs> because governments are very, um, you know, politicians, if it sells well, they're more likely to back it if mm. it sounds good. Um, or if powerful interests are involved, they're more likely to back it if somebody's got their ear. But things that aren't that flash but actually have, have long-term benefits, like finding answers to those problems, that's if they're going to support anything and not just leave it to the market, that's what we need to be supporting mm. because those are the really curly questions that people are having trouble answering, mm. um, not levers you can pull to get more people in EVs. Mm. We don't need to be mm. doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So looking, having a discussion first, acknowledging your the negatives of whatever proposal, having a discussion, addressing them and thinking long term. And and that's not just for EVs, that's for any policy. Yeah. Yeah. 
Good thoughts, Mary Ann. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Jason. In an environment where we're driven to take sides, navigating the center of the road feels as dangerous as riding the median strip in rush hour. And few topics trigger stronger emotions than environmental ones. The Supreme Court's recent ruling allowing an individual to sue high-emitting companies for climate change reflects how pervasive the topic is in both personal and societal contexts. The now sputtering EV revolution has long promised to address our personal culpability, weaning us off polluting fuels until our roads hum with the sweet sound of sun power. However, propping up the industry with subsidies and quotas may trade one kind of pollution for another, incentivizing good PR over real progress. Worthy solutions are always messier than the silver bullets marketed by politicians and industries with narrow and possibly self-serving definitions of success. They know we love uncomplicated answers that demand a little personal sacrifice and even less thought. I'm certainly tempted to replace my 2009 Demio, which nature is reclaiming one rust spot at a time, with an EV. The thought of my home's solar panels fueling transport makes my frugal, conservation-minded heart happy. Sadly, my next car will probably be another middle-aged petrol compact, because I'm also a sucker for fats. Mining materials for EV batteries continues to have significant drawbacks, both environmentally and socially, and there still aren't sufficient materials to supply the demand ambitious governments want to create. Running EVs isn't carbon neutral either. Even the cleanest energy has waste problems, and our electricity supply is under pressure without plugging a million vehicles into the grid. EVs also weigh more, taking a heavier toll on roads and chewing through tires, vehicles' biggest landfill filler, faster. And if an EV battery combusts, the car will burn hotter and longer than other vehicles. Some transport companies are even asking whether the risk of EVs on car ferries is too great. The old firefighting trick of hosing flames down is so ineffective that the best option is often monitoring EV fires, letting them burn out, hoping they don't reignite days later. As a result, one Norwegian line has banned them. They also expire sooner than their traditional cousins. Damage to a single battery cell requires either a new battery or, since they often cost more than the car is worth, a new vehicle. Once I reach the lithium elephant in the room, how unprepared we are to recycle the inevitable tsunami of dead batteries, I found myself here, in the middle of the road. Do we care about the places where components are mined and batteries built, or are we only interested in ticking boxes for New Zealand's reputation? Does it matter where toxic components end up, or is that for another generation to worry about? Let's be honest, EV technology holds great promise for reducing pollution, but it isn't ready for mass adoption. If we spent less time on aspirational policies and put more effort into discovering and supporting the best and most necessary innovations, we might find both the consensus and the answers we're looking for. Thanks for listening to the Maxim Institute podcast. If you'd like to hear more from us and keep up with the rest of our research and analysis of politics and policy in New Zealand, you can sign up on the homepage of our website to get our monthly forum email and invitations to future Maxim Institute events. You can search and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. From the team at Maxim, Mate wa, goodbye for now. <laughs>